Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here for organizing that. Um, I'll start by saying that about 10 years ago, I wanted to write an intellectual history of the 1967 war in the Middle East. Basically, the 1967 war, the Six Days War, it's, as it's uh, known, is credited with completely transforming um, the Arab world. It is being said, and we can argue about it, but it is being said that there was a secular world that was completely destroyed afterwards, and that if there was any universal project in the Arab world prior to the 67 war, it completely disappeared afterwards to the degree that the whole culture veered to some form of religiosity, sunk into itself um, uh, deeper and deeper into some position of Islamic fundamentalism. That's the caricature of the war. And I was, I was always intrigued by this. I said, what could be defeated in the desert in six days that render a military defeat into such cultural defeat? What, what, was, what was actually happening there? What was intellectually defeat? What was the project that was defeated? So because I'm an intellectual historian, I thought, OK, I'll start reading all the important magazines, debates, books, look at all the intellectuals across the Arab world from the late 30s to the late 60s, which is for various reasons, uh, uh, one intellectual unit, uh, the, sort of the post-colonial era, the first phase of the post-colonial era. So I started reading for a few years, and immediately it occurred to me that no matter what I look at, I see the term wujudia, existentialism. I see uh, uh, increased references to Jean-Paul Sartre. And after a few years of that, it dawned on me that what I'm actually looking at is at something that could be described as maybe the largest existentially seen outside of Europe. And so significant, not only in terms of the number of the publications, translations, debate, intellectuals who self-identify themselves as existentialists, it is a, 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 a constitute, it was constitutive, in fact, to a whole post-colonial era project of uh, creating a new Arab self that is coming out of the colonial era, trying to rethink what was colonial culture, what it did to us, what it did to the Arab subject, and begin to imagine a new kind of uh, uh, person. And indeed, in the Arab world, um, it is being now uh, documented by me and some others, uh, including Shireen, which is, uh, who is sitting here behind us, um, um, it is uh, being acknowledged that no other Western intellectual was ever so engaged, translated, uh, 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 read, venerated, and so on as Jean-Paul Sartre. It's for about two decades, he really dominated a whole spectrum of what was happening in, the, in Arab culture. And also, also, this was not one of these one-way relationships. You know, they translate, and he's somewhere there in Paris. There are two-way relationship in the sense of a community, a circle of uh, Arab intellectuals, Palestinians and Egyptians, who meet with him, who discuss with him various issues, who are eventually bringing him to the Arab world. And uh, uh, this relationship lasted for several years. Um, there were uh, not documented, uh, I'm completing a book now with various diaries and, 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 and sources in, in Arabic and in Hebrew which document this relationship. It's a, it's a forgotten episode from a historical perspective. It uh, would not appear in any biography of, of Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, not any Stolal Cohen, not others. Um, so it is an re important relationship. But there's something else to this relationship that immediately I understood that this is a relationship that ended in a, 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 a major disappointment for the Arab world. Um, not simply a disappointment, but an act of betrayal. And not simply an act of betrayal by South, but what Arab intellectuals refer to as an iconic betrayal, in the sense that Sartre betrayed the Arab project to which he contributed uh, uh, knowingly more than any other uh, um, intellectual. So I was also intrigued by the question that I'd like to address today, what, what did exactly Sartre betray? What happened? As you can imagine, it has to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict, with the fact that a week after he was photographed here, he went to Tel Aviv. And uh, it's in the context of what was called the Arab-Israeli conflict that something happened. And uh, uh, 
there was a breakdown in the relationship so severe and so serious um, that uh, immediately following the breakdown in the relationship, which happened in basically one act of Sartre signing some petition, um, he was disowned almost overnight. Uh, there even, there's even a CIA report on that, believe it or not. I mean, there's CIA reports on everything, but uh, <laughs> there's a, even a, a, you know, a report on, on, on how he was disowned almost immediately. Even his books were uh, 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 burned. Baghdad, that was known as the capital of Arab existentialism, his uh, work was banned there, uh, um, and, 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 uh, and so on. So that's, this is the, the, the phenomena we're looking at in the breakdown of the relationship. And now I'd like to kind of take us more slowly and, and try to understand what exactly is Arab existentialism? What exactly is the project that Arab intellectuals took so systematically, I would dare say so religiously in a secular way, so religiously? Um, and how did it uh, uh, unravel? And what does, what does it actually uh, mean? I will start by saying that the discovery of existentialism in the Middle East does not start with uh, start Sartre, or Western existentialism. It, start, it starts actually with, uh, with Heidegger, but I, I guess that's the talk for the UK Heidegger Society, if there is such. Uh, um, um, but at, at some point, uh, Alexander Coire, who is a person who brought also Heidegger to France, comes to teach in Cairo. Uh, yes, escaping the Nazis in, in June 1940, he finds himself in Cairo, and over there he meets several people who are several uh, students who understand what he's talking and, and understand what he's bringing to Cairo. And they begin to think with this, and that is being tied immediately uh, uh, to Sufism, to Islamic mysticism, and the possibilities of uh, constructing a new Arab self, which is not. Uh, uh, um, uh, of the essence, but of the synchronicity of existence, which is, of course, a very promising proposition if you're coming out of the colonial era. So that's, uh, you know, I cannot talk about this now, that's in brackets, but this is a project that is going on in the late uh, 40s uh, and precedes the reception of Sartre. Um, be, you know, Sartre's work hasn't been translated yet and so on. Um, but then there is a, an interesting moment of the arrival of Sartre to, to the Middle East. First of all, this discovery of uh, engagement, of, of this engagement, and this committed, committed intellectual. That doesn't pass very well at the beginning um, because the leading intelligence in the Arab world, especially Ta Hussein, who's the doyen of Arab letters, uh, a genius by all accounts, a very broad spectrum of writing and thinking, a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. But he didn't like Sartre very much. He was, uh, I would dare say, a little bit of a colonial humanist, very much implicated in the structure of colonialism and culture. Uh, he wrote famously that the future of Egypt is that of Paris, is that of France, that they should, that, you know, Arabs should become basically Europeans. He wrote it in 1939. It's a platform for a new era. You understand it's not going to translate very well to a post-colonial era. So when uh, Sartre goes after André Gide, who's a friend of Ta Hussein, you can imagine that Ta Hussein actually think, oh, this guy is, uh, you know, this young guy in Paris, all the rage, is, is, is maybe not for us. But nonetheless, he translates the major terms in which Sartre thinks and the term itself of, of engagement, of, 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 of commitment, as iltizam. But that's just there in some journal. It doesn't make a big splash, no one cares about it, until a young person from Beirut, Suhail Idris, who is a literary critic, just emerging as a literary critic, um, goes to Paris for a PhD right in the, in the time in which you know, existentialism is this kind of street philosophy, a philosophy of the cafe, in which whether you understand what it is or not, that, that's not the point of it. You live it, you listen to music, you are having sex, you are in this kind of carnival. And he's completely taken by, by the atmosphere and by the possibilities that the atmosphere, that, it, that this carnival opens for, for someone who's coming out of the colonial situation in the Middle East, which is kind of, a, for him, a double colonialism of the French, of the British, and of the family structure, conventions of society which are suffocating, uh, as he understood that, especially sexually. 
Um, and he especially is being taken not only by that, but also by Le Temps Modern. The, the fact that you can put a magazine there, that is a literary, cultural, political magazine that is involved, that is taking on issues. There is no such thing in our world. The magazines that are there are not satisfactory for if, you, if you're going to reboot and start another culture, a post-colonial culture. So he is taking the formula of Le Temps Modern, brings it to Beirut, calls it El Adab, Begin, the first issue begins in 1953. It almost has an identical kind of uh, statement of purpose to Le Temps Modern. It's kind of a, a mirror image, but of course with its, own, with its own agenda. It's not some you know, cut and paste issue here. Um, and that becomes the most dominant magazine in the Arab world easily in the 50s and 60s, possibly all the way to the, civil li uh, Lebanon, the Lebanese Civil War in 1975. It's a major, major venue. Um, that is actually uh, 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 a marketplace for these new ideas. And for him, he, he accepts also personally this idea of the Sartarian existentialist Arab thinker. And he, he's doing it on various levels, including actually playing himself as if he's Sartar, his wife, Aida Idris would become the major translator of text, of everything that comes from, radiates from Paris and every third world thought, uh, including Fanon and so on. This would be this power couple, as they would be called in the US today, uh, um, really uh, 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 um, brought to the Arab world an entire uh, um, full of new writers and, um, and new thinking, and they kind of also played as, as if she's Beauvoir and he is uh, uh, South. So the first project of Suil Idris is actually to contribute to the change of guard within the intellectual uh, hierarchy of the Arab world. When you look around in the mid-50s, you see who are the leading intellectuals. They're all intellectuals who are coming out of the colonial era, out of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They're complacent with colonialism to a degree, and they don't understand the needs of the post-colonial generation, which is not simply physical liberation. It is indeed existential liberation. It is indeed a sense that as always in colonialism, that um, the cultural environment and the self are not sinking at all. And uh, uh, you have to create synchronicity, which is known as, authentic, as, a, as a condition of authenticity, a sala in Arabic, and for this you have so to mine your, your heritage, the Turaf, so there's a whole new conversation that starts that they feel would correspond to the needs of um, the post-colonial generation. They also have another problem that the previous generation was complacent with, uh, that not only of human dignity and uh, a, a, new, uh, a requirement for a new Arab self, but also of social justice. Life expectancy in Egypt uh, in the late 30s would be 35 year old for, uh, uh, for a man. That includes infant mortality, but you understand, it's. It's uh, uh, what kind of society you are going to build if people die like flies as uh, uh, um, really subaltern peasants with no, no voice, no nothing. Certainly not as citizens. Basically, this is a zone of, of, of non-being in, in Sartre's uh, uh, term. So they are beginning to envision a new society, and the concept that they choose to change culture, to revolutionize culture, is Sartre's terms of engagement, which they call iltizam. It was basically the idea that you, you take the established generation and you kick them out. You, you basically politicize culture, politicize every act of literature. So uh, 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 the culture that would emerge can begin to account for the new politics that should happen and should guide society forward. And that's a joint project of young people. Uh, some of them actually are not, uh, uh, have nothing to do with certain thoughts. Some of them are actually are communist and Marxist in the sense that uh, they follow uh, socialist realism, Soviet socialist realism, which is the best way to politicize uh, 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 culture. Uh, but they use Sartarian terms. So there are various fights within the Arab world of who is the authentic Sartre, what did Sartre mean by, by iltizam, engagement, and so on. 
Um, I'm describing this episode just to let you know that decolonization is not simply an act of, of pushing against the structure of Europe and so on. It's also an act of quite immediately uh, a revolutionary change within one's culture in the sense that you identify people who need to be phased out, needs to be... And, and it's a generational project, obviously, right? So Sartre's existentialism and the concept of engagement is already uh, in the 50s uh, um, operating on two important levels. One, on the project of creating a new Arab uh, uh, self, understanding that we are coming out of a colonial condition that we need to uh, uh, understand. Uh, um, and that's, that's going to develop. And the other is simply by the idea that we need to purge our culture, purge people, um, and so on. Now, uh, the project of the self is a very slow one to emerge because no one read a corpus of what is you know, Sartre's thought processed in hindsight and says, okay, this is what we're doing. It arrives at piecemeal. It arrives at, you know, it's being packed in Marseille, unpacked in Alexandria, unpacked in Beirut, it's slow to emerge, but there is an understanding that there is a condition of otherness and that the colonial uh, subject, as it began to be understood in the 50s, um, everywhere is not that different than the condition of slavery, the condition of, uh, of black people, and the conditions of other minorities like at women. This understanding that we are a uh, 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 form of, of collective other begins, begins to uh, uh, circulate. Now, um, the next uh, um, breakthrough, in a way, in how Sartre's thought was applied to the region has nothing to do with uh, uh, particularly um, with his philosophical writing. By the late 50s, this idea of race, otherness, uh, alterity, these ideas, uh, uh, they do circulate widely, but they also nourish different political projects. Sartre's understanding did not nourish only one political project. Uh, people who are politically disagree on what should be the future of the Middle East, communists and nationalists, for example, Pan-Arab nationalists, both took this concept as constitutive for the project, uh, claim to be Sartrean thought, but they want to see really two different realities. But in the late 50s and early 60s, the third meaning of what does it mean, what does it mean to be Sartrean beginning to circulate, and that is actually more immediate, more promising, and something they connect to a little bit better. And this is this global activism. They read Sartre on Cuba, they read uh, uh, the, uh, what would become colonialism and neocolonialism, they read about, obviously, uh, uh, the situation in Congo. Um, they, read every, they read and translate immediately everything that Sartre puts together and other people who think uh, um, uh, like him. And this is a time in which Pan-Arabism is a form of uh, new political theology of the nation with this idea of sacrifice, that you are sacrificed on behalf of the nation and through this sacrifice you are being reborn as a liberated Arab subject. This form of Pan-Arabism, it lives in, in the Egyptian uh, version of it and also in the Syrian version of it as Baathism. But both of them use the concept of iltizam at the core. The concept of iltizam was uh, this commitment is domi becomes appropriated into this form of Arab nationalism with the idea that the sacrifice on behalf of the nation is that which, which allow you to reinvent yourself. And this is before the translation of Fanon to Arabic. Uh, so it's not about violence. It's not about anti-colonial violence that liberates the self. This is simply about all form of sacrifice. For example, if you are a nurse, if you're a doctor, if you're an engineer, just do a good job on behalf of the nation. Be an ethical human being, and that would help us to recreate society. Now, um, at this point, uh, the Arab world began to frame itself also in socialist terms, especially in Egypt and Syria. And the idea is, again, a revolutionary idea. It's, a, it's the idea that the revolution is not simply a political revolution. It's not uh, uh, to capture power. It's not Saddam Hussein or the Assads. 
it is a revolution whose major goal in the and that's all the theoretical writing in Arabic in the 50s and 60s about revolution up, up until the Ba'ath takes over in the mid 60s late 60s are about an ontological revolution how to revolutionize the human subject because this is the person that should be recreated um, and here again um, the, ex the revolutionary example was such that when they read, when they look at Sartre's global activism, what they took from it is ethics, is a form of ethics, uh, uh, unspelled yet in any theoretical way, not even in the critique of dialectical reason, uh, which they had problem uh, discussing, translating, negotiating. Um, but basically, by looking at what Sartre is doing and what is he saying is right and wrong. So they look at the engagement in Algeria, obviously. They look at the Congo, they look at Cuba, and they, all of the terms with which he discusses disengagement, these ideas of, uh, uh, of otherness, of uh, racial inferiority, of uh, colonialism as a system, an earlier, earlier text, all of these resonate with the Arab intelligentsia and the political elite increasingly one by one, to the degree that they see that their project is overlapping. How much overlapping is uh, the fact that Egypt, uh, for example, is the leading or is leading this project, takes uh, uh, begins to be involved in the Congo conflict, sends troops, sends arms uh, uh, as an extension, really, of of Sartre's text on uh, Patrice Lumumba. So this was not for them simply they're doing a revolution in the Arab world, revolution in Egypt. The position of being revolutionary is a global one. Why is it a global one? Because if you are trying to transcend your colonial situation, you are actually, what you're actually dealing with is an attempt to reinvent freedom. And freedom is not bound by space. It is not a freedom in the land of Egypt, the freedom in the Palestinian refugee camps, the freedom uh, 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 in Lebanon or Syria. It's the freedom of, of the individual. And the freedom of individual against neocolonialism is a global fight. And hence, when the Arabs begin <laughs> to be engaged in the battle for freedom, and in the effort to reinvent this new universal subject, the frontiers of this effort are global. And this is why they are being involved basically around the world, including in Yemen against British colonialism, uh, where they put considerable resources towards the liberation of Yemen, or what they thought is the liberation of Yemen, and so on. And um, to their surprise, they have a philosopher, the most influential philosopher, the, the anti-ambassador, as uh, he was called, who's going around the world, speaking in the same language they speak, involved in the same project. There's complete compatibility within the concepts that he's using and they're using. The concepts are illuminating and supportive of the Arab project, as they are supportive of the... Uh, broader project of, uh, I call it the, the ethical subject of the left. What is being really created in the early 60s is this kind of ethical subject. It's a universal subject of the left that Sartre as a global activist, for lack of a better word, uh, 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 epitomizes. So the hope of the Arab intelligentsia and the Arab world as a whole, that by engaging in this global fight successfully, they would transcend the colonial situation and would emerge simply as a global, ci global citizens, as, as emancipated people, not simply as those who fought against uh, uh, French colonialism or this or that. Now, what is the big thing that I'm missing here yet in this lecture is, okay, so what about Zionism? Where is this Zionism and the relation to Zionism and to Israel stands in all of this? The Arab intellectuals like Faiz Sayer, a Palestinian, who begin to take on salt, and when I say begin to take on salt, it's not simply that these people... Uh, read a few things in the Tamp Modern, translated it. Faisai, Risham Sharabi, especially Palestinians, hooked up with existentialist philosophy from the very beginning, from the late 40s. And not only Sartre, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, they both do PhD in existentialist philosophy, one in Chicago, the other one in uh, Georgetown University. Uh, um, you know, Faisai was also working in the UN. Uh, uh, um, um, with the people who, had, who worked on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So these are people who really understood existentialist philosophy, but also thought about it in terms of being a Palestinian refugee, of the state of statelessness, 
in the state of being the other of the Israelis, of the Zionists. So they are thinking with these terms. They seem to be applicable with Sartre, you know, compatible, excuse me, with Sartre's thought. And now the questions that they are beginning to press is, all right, if there is neocolonialism, if uh, 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 there is a situation of systematic uh, 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 racism in which... Uh, 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 um, the Arab world is otherized through this relationship, and if you think about Algeria as a classic case of this relationship, what would you think about, that's the question they pose, what would you think about Zionism? Where does that stand in Sartre's scheme of things, intellectually? And it's a question that is being answered by, uh, not, uh, is, is not being answered. It's being answered by ambiguity, by nothing, to begin with. So that uh, begin to be concerns in the Arab press, where they're beginning to press the question. But Sartre, too, understands that 1965, and that's, I think, where the new sources that I found, I think, are a little bit illuminating how he got to this pyramid in the end. Sartre understands that he needs to actually, within, that his ethical uh, project is very clear globally. The, the, there is the decolonized, the, the, the colonized and the colonizer, the you know, ethically right and wrong, good and bad. You can tell in every place you go who is the right and who is the bad. What do you do in Palestine? What do you do about the nature of Zionism? And Sartre begins to understand that he needs to, to study it. So, um, in 1965, he finds in Paris two interlocutors. One is an Egyptian young journalist, very ambitious uh, man, and another one is an Israeli uh, um, delegate for the Socialist Israel Party, Mapam, that had nice ideas but never any clout in, 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 in politics. Um, and he begins to talk to them, especially begins to talk to Ali al-Saman, who arrived to Paris a little bit before the Israeli delegate. They meet almost every week for a whole year. And Sartre begins to learn from him uh, about the realities of the Middle East, of what does it mean to have a socialist revolution. And Ali Saman presses the question, all right, so what do you think? You know, how, how this, we agree on everything. How come the situation in Algeria is not applied to Zionism? Are there, are Palestinians out there of the Israelis? If so, how do we, how do we address it? Um, Sartre immediately, uh, and it's not only Sartre, it's La Temps Moderne, it's the whole journal. They said, okay, we're going to study this, we're going to do a fact-finding mission, and we're going to publish a special issue of La Temps Moderne, which indeed published in June 67, a special issue, and the special issue is going to be about uh, trying to il illuminate, elucidate the condition of the conflict. So just by my language, you understand that we're almost talking about a Lyotard and a postmodern position. That is, it's a conflict so severe that you cannot uh, uh, try to solve it. You cannot try to intervene. All you can do is ask the Arab side to publish 15 art to write 15 articles about what they think is the conflict. And you can ask the Israelis to write another 15 articles, put them one next to another, not in conversation, not in a dialogue, next to one another, so that each person can see the position of the other and perhaps dialectically emerge into a new position of understanding that might in the future suggest the possibility of a dialogue. This is a non-ethic ethics. Sartre doesn't have anything like this in any other involvement. But here, that's the project he proposes. Uh, both the Israelis and the Arabs don't want to participate in that. They want clear answers. In Israel, Sartre was known as the Arab philosopher because they understood how constitutive he is to the Arab project, to the post-colonial project. Uh, Sartre did not have such relationship or engagement in, uh, intellectually, ideologically, philosophically in Israel. It's a different story there. Um, but after two years of preparing this, eventually he's ready to come to the region. And he agrees to go to Egypt, and he agrees to go to Israel, and he agrees to uh, go to the uh, Palestinian refugee camps. The visit itself is um, uh, something that was, it was never studied. It was never, uh, um, you have to bring a lot of sources into to this. It's a, it's, a, it's a really long story, but 
Uh, there were a few statements that Sartre made, some of them in French, some in Hebrew that were translated to French, and these are the sources that are being used to understand what Sartre did on the conflict. Um, and um, what is missing here is not what Sartre said, which is not a lot, because the guy who would not, res who would not stop himself from saying uh, uh, what he thought about any kind of conflict in the world resisted the very, fa the very thing for which he was very famous, which is the text. He, he did not write a text on that. He did not want to say anything concrete. So what is left is to try to read his body language, to try to read what happens in this visit. Um, and uh, the, there are a lot of sources that tell us. So to begin with, it's not Sartre's visit. All three of these visits. Lanzmann, Claude Lanzmann, uh, he is the uh, uh, producing manager of Latin Modern, very influential within the apparatus. The whole project of the visit was not a Sartre project, it's a, it's a, it's a project of the whole Sartre circle. It's a, the machine of Latin Modern is putting this together. So Lanzmann is putting it together. Uh, Lanzmann is a Jew, he's a Holocaust survivor, and he is a, a staunchly, as you probably know, uh, a pro Zionist. He is actually in the midst, as he, as he revealed in his autobiography, but also interviewed him for this project. He's in the midst of discovering why he is a Zionist. So obviously, not a very good person is fine of an honest broker here in the project. Simone de Beauvoir actually have very strong feelings too about what's happening in the Middle East, and she's also... Um, taking very clearly a Zionist uh, uh, standpoint. Um, the only one who is actually not persuaded by them is Sartre. And to understand Sartre's position, you have to understand the relationship between the three of them, which is a relationship that, of course, has many uh, uh, personal and, 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 and you know, other... Uh, 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 but, but this is, this is... If you want to understand Sartre's position on Palestine, you have to understand this triangle. So they go to Egypt. It's immediately obvious to Lanzmann, I'll start by his perspective, that, that Sartre has the time of his life. He is very happy. He is being discovering something, a form of revolution. And you have to understand, this is 1967. It's before May 68, the dead years in, 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 in French history. Nothing happens between 62 and 68, right? The, you know, and where is the example of revolutionary people? It's in China, it's in Cuba, and it's in the Arab world. It's, if you want to know how to be a revolutionary, come to the Arab world. You know, because Europe really has nothing to offer, and here is a form of socialism that can work. Uh, so Sartre is being uh, uh, very impressed uh, by this, but also personally, he's having a good time. You cannot put him to sleep by the end of the day. He's drinking, he's going uh -huh. on denial, he's partying. His schedule, if you follow the schedule, two weeks there, it's packed. And everywhere he goes, you know, there's piles and piles of his books translated. Everyone, one, everybody wants to engage him and so on. Uh, uh, everybody's familiar with his thoughts, or what they think or his, his thoughts are. He, he, at some point he said, look, your existentialism is, uh, how did he put it? It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a fashion. It's not like, it's not, you know, you have to engage more seriously, he wanted to tell them. But I... I Personally, for my work, you know, the idea that Arab existentialism was not the real existentialism, I don't care about it. I think it's, uh, you know, we can talk about it later. Um, whatever uh, non-serious non European existentialism it was, it was very serious in the Arab world. So uh, he's, very, he's very happy with it. But as the visit in Egypt it goes on, the happier he is, the less happy Lanzmann is. Because Lanzmann begins to understand, hey, He's not going to fall on the side of, of Israel in the end, in the end of the story. Uh, they go to the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Egyptians did not want the tour to be hijacked by the Palestinian issue. Uh, some intellectuals wanted, but not the Egyptian government, uh, Egyptian Al Aram, the newspaper that hosted them, the state newspaper. They did not want the Palestinian uh, agenda to take over. They wanted Sartre to acknowledge the revolutionary effort of Egypt as a place that managed to do socialism, anti-imperialism, 
and uh, being nationalist at the same time, which everybody in Europe in the 60s, that's kind of like the, the golden, you know, if you can do this, uh, that, that's, that's terrific. And here's an example, and specifically Nasser wanted Sartre to write a book about him, the same way in which he wrote about, you know, a, a, a hurricane in uh, Cuba, or what's it called, mm -hmm. Sartre in Cuba, it's was translated. He wants the same book. And Egyptians believe that the special issue of Latam Moder is not actually these Israelis and Arabs writing next to each other, it's a special issue on, the, on them, on the revolution. Uh, nothing was, of course it wasn't true, so, you know, they, they, the Palestinian issue was kind of played down. But Sartre goes to the Palestinian refugee camps in Gaza Strip, he's being taken by what he's seeing, I have very good documentation. Uh, um, as to how influential the visit was. Uh, at some point he's taking, just to uh, explain that you really have to look at what is happening in the visit between the three of them. He's being, uh, he, uh, he, he, some kids uh, came and stood next to him with the Palestinian flag. A journalist took a picture of that. Lanzmann came to the journalist and said, no, no, you have to expose the film. You cannot have a picture of Sartre next to Palestinian kids with the flag because then you're taking a position, you're identifying you said your position is that of non-position, of total absence, as Sartre said. So this is a problem. Ex they exposed the film. Apparently, for the second time in the tour in which they exposed the film, there's also uh, in Cairo, they were asked to expose it once. Uh, this is why we don't have many pictures also from Gaza Strip. Uh, he's also reading, Lance might notice that he's reading The End of the Jewish People, which is um, some sociolo French sociologists put together, basically arguing that Zionism would finish off Journalism, uh, Judaism. I think it's uh, before the Judith Butler of the time, uh, you know, parting ways that she wrote. I think that's kind of a, something along these lines. And Klansman said, That's what you're reading before going to Israel? I mean, that's, the, you know, a, a book that is anti Zionist. So Lanzmann is very shaken at this point. Bouvar is also unhappy. Uh, she's unhappy because she also gave talks in Cairo University, and whatever she talks about was the second sex. And the questions she got from Egyptian men drove her crazy. Why aren't you married uh, to Sartre, n n not knowing that she's actually dating this guy? Uh, um, you know, um, and very patriarchal attitude towards her. Um, the record, she was really outraged by, by this. It also doesn't go well in the Gaza Strip. They, there's a fight with the refugees. They were not polite. They wanted him to identify with them right now. Sartre basically said, I'm supporting the right of return, but nothing more than that. Uh, so it didn't go well. And also for the Palestinians, you know, what are the Zionists? They, they don't, they're not called Zionists. They're called El Yahud, the Jews, because that's the people they saw. That's the people they confronted. And uh, uh, they know that Landsman is Jewish. So there was a whole uh, uh, tirade against the Jews that Lanzmann and Bouvard read as anti-Semitic uh, and didn't sit very well uh, with them as, at all. So the visit in the Gaza Strip is, is a complete failure. Then they go to Israel. The reception, they fly through Athens. The reception in the airport is a disaster. Uh, Sartre is unhappy. He doesn't smile, doesn't want to talk to journalists. All the newspaper the next day give him bad press. Who needs this guy? Who brought him? We cannot handle this. We just had Gunter Grass coming. These Nazis, the Israeli psyche is burdened already with that. No one wants, you know, but you cannot ruin a visit. So people are still trying to put kind of a nice face to it. Sartre immediately begins to act out. He goes to the Weizmann Institute, it's the Israelis MIT, to meet the Israeli scientists. They show him how the Zionists, you know, are doing, we're doing this science and this project. He hears them with their perfect English and says, you guys are just, you know, American imperialists, there's nothing in it. Okay. Lanzmann hears this and said, I had it with you. And he leaves the tour. A tour that he worked two years to produce. He worked very hard. He had to come to Israel to persuade all the Israelis to participate. Israel has nothing to do with Sartre. He said... I had it with you. Takes an airplane and leave. On the opposite direction, Sartre's adopted daughter comes in mm -hmm. uh, uh, to join him. And, and there's a whole complexity of it that I cannot go into here. The next few days, Sartre begins systematically to cancel all his appointments. Uh, he was having an appointment with Ben-Gurion, the founder of the state, uh, who lives in his cabin in the desert. On the way, they say, I don't, I don't feel like doing it. All right, this is canceled. 
is having a meeting with the Israeli chief of staff, Yitzhak Rabin. That's three months before the 67 war. On the way, he said, I'm not doing that. I'm, I don't want to do that. So the Israelis tell him, look, but you just met the Egyptian army. He said, I, you know, so how does that? You have to meet the Israeli army too. He said, I'm not doing that. Then it was a meeting in the parliament, in the Knesset, with all the right, all the parties. I'm not reading anything from the right. I don't have anything to talk with them. Fine, this is cancelled. Then they go to dinner with Igal Alon and a, a general, and then a minister, and kind of another kind of Zionist icon. He's a very handsome man. He has a house on the Sea of Galilee, on the cliff, looking, the whole thing. Very nice. Simon de Beauvoir comes out of there. It was a beautiful evening. It was wonderful. Sartre says he was the most sympathetic fascist I've ever met. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's a disaster. Of, he doesn't fall for Zionism. He doesn't like Zionism. It's in, in the body language. It's obvious. It's documented, even though he doesn't leave a text. Then he goes to meet Holocaust survivors. And here, the situation begins to be more complex, because at the heart of it is the, is the issue of otherness and hierarchy of otherness. Um, can you create within your uh, a philosophical work, uh, framework uh, a hierarchy of otherness in which you would say that the others of Europe, the Holocaust survivor who met, was sympathetic to, uh, uh, said very encouraging things on behalf of the project that they were engaged with there in a kibbutz and how they recreated their life and made a claim for life and all of that. Can you establish a hierarchy between the Holocaust survivor and a Palestinian refugee that was kicked out when the Holocaust survivor came. How do you how do you engage this problem? Now there is no there is no elaboration on that. He hoped that the whole project would create more more uh, uh, um, a better understanding of this, but that that obviously uh, in the end did not happen. Uh, but he um, he's obviously taken by that. At the same time. It's very interesting. He saw in the Holocaust survivor also something which is of the universal, in the same way in which he saw in the revolutionaries in the Arab world and in Cairo. Uh, while he's there, I found out that he is really busy trying to bring a woman who's, known, who's a, a, a Holocaust survivor and a very public figure, uh, Heike Grossman. He wants her to serve on the Russell, uh, on the, on the Russell Tribunal. Uh, to try the Americans in Vietnam, right? He wants a Holocaust survivor to sit there and, and salvage this voice as an ethical voice, right? Um, and there's a whole side story to this, but also we begin to understand sort of the uh, uh, complexity that he had. And he also had some public fight, a nasty fight with the head of one of the, of the Socialist Party in which Sartre tells him, what about the right of return? And he tells him it's an abstract. What is the right of return? It's abstract. So, uh, so uh, Sartre says, you know, what's wrong with, with abstraction? He said, well, you cannot do, I'm a politician, I'm a practical man, you cannot do anything with, uh, with abstraction. And anyway, we were promised a state in 1917, and instead we got Auschwitz, so that's what I think of your abstraction. So Sartre tells him, you see the refugees around the border? They're not an abstraction. That's that's a real it's a real problem. Even if we talk about the right of return in abstract terms, so the whole thing doesn't work. Just before he leaves in the airport, he actually says something sympathetic of the Zionist project of, but only in terms of otherness. He said this is a place in which you can be a Jew without the thing that constitutes you as a Jew is not the gaze of the other, but what you created, right? That immediately starts a, a, a firestorm in the Arab world. How did he dare say that? Now, part of the thing that was not understood in the Arab reception of Sartre, a lot of things were not understood or didn't want to understand. For example, the relationship between them was not understood because when Beauvoir's memoir uh, was translated, uh, Suhail Idris removed her relationship with Lanzmann from the text. So no one knew, actually, that it's more comp And those that knew didn't say anything. Um, but more significantly than that, the Arabs used the notion of the other to identify themselves, especially the Palestinians. The fact that this notion of the other already today in the conference, uh, in the first and second session, was identified twice as this Jewishness came. You know, this idea that the other was predicated on the experience of the Jews in Europe and, and the Holocaust. Uh, um, and then extended from there 
um, in, in, in congruity with other things that happened in Paris at the time to other races, uh, to women, and so on. This was not understood very, very well on the philosophical level. So it was not processed that this otherness had some Jewish seed in it, which complicates also the post-colonial era project. In any way, the visit ends. It's three months before 67 war. The region is already going, is going to go to war. And that's obvious, even though Nasser tells them, how much time do I have, five minutes? Even though Sartre tells that, uh, not, not Gamal Abdel Nasser tells uh, uh, Lanzmann and he tells Bouvard and Sartre, I don't want to go to war, I don't want to do war, nothing is going to come out of it. The situation becomes very bad. It's the late May, Sartre is writing the introduction to the special issue. The atmosphere in Paris is that of a second Holocaust is going to come. Uh, the French, French Jews, for the most part, hasn't discussed publicly the betrayal of the French Republic um, in, during the Second World War. Uh, so the 50s, where the Holocaust was not spoken, the 67 war, the eve of the war, was an opportunity for French Jews, dozens of thousands of them who came in one famous demonstration, to say, you are abandoning Israel, this is going to be a second Holocaust now. With the, with the war coming, you have to take a public stance on that. Um, one of the people who are central to uh, this notion of a second Holocaust is Lanzmann, who is very active in, the, in late May in Paris, in, in beginning to mobilize public opinion uh, to take a stand against Nasser. The atmosphere in Paris is anti-Arab, it's xenophobic, uh, uh, it's racist, it's obvious, it's well documented, I don't need to really kind of uh, prove it. Uh, even Simone de Beauvoir, who was for Israel, writes in a memoir how disgusting it was. And Sartre's interlocutors, especially Ludwig Hulli and others, are there. In, um, in Paris at the time, uh, at this point, Lanzmann says we have to really mobilize the entire French left to support Israel, and they come up with a manifesto that basically says... Uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the Egyptians are the aggressors here, they should take a step back, um, uh, and so on. Everybody signs it, from Picasso, Marguerite Duras, everybody signs it. Fifth, Yankelevich, 58 intellectuals. If there was any, a French intelligentsia, they're all there. Of course, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, Sartre doesn't want to sign. So he's avoiding them, but Lanzmann is chasing him. As he described to me, I wanted the signature. He's waiting outside his home, waiting, waiting. Finally, Sartre comes. They have an exchange there about the second Holocaust. Sartre gives him the signature. The next day, disappears in Le Monde, and in the Arab world, there is a gas. It was immediately, immediately cables arrived to Paris. How did you do that? How did you divest? It's under this situation. The stress on Sartre is enormous. The cables, the Arab interlocutors he had, are people he had relationship with. And this relationship, look, today, Lanzmann is the last man standing. You know, he can, in an interview, tell me a lot of things that I need to corroborate from another source. Um, and I found the sources, including Israeli intelligence sources, believe it or not, were on the case, too. Um, so there is this, a, a rich understanding, relatively, of what was going on in the pressures. It's under this pressure he's writing the introduction for the special issue. It's a thousand pages. It's like this. Uh, of his position of absence, but his position of absence and this whole structure of ambiguity that he maintained for two years, which is a betrayal of his own ethics, especially in Arab eyes, doesn't apply. He just signed the manifesto. It's quite clear what is happening in the manifesto. He took sides. Um, it's June 5th. The special issue arrived to the stores just as the war begins. It's a, it's a complete destruction of, um, of, of the Arab army is a complete destruction of the post-colonial project. Now, I started by what was defeated in 67. There is, a, there is a postscript to this story, but what was defeated in 67? Um, the sto it's, it's not that existentialism is the most important thing, but the story of Sartre and existentialism in the Arab world does capture it's not the most important thing, again, you know, it's not like everything was existentialism, but it does capture very sensitively the course 
of Arab thought. And symbolically, the fall of relationship with Sartre is the betrayal of the possibility of, of any uni universal, universal position from, for uh, the Arabs. The idea in the 60s is that if they revolt, if they are part of this global revolution, and they emerge as these global subjects that also sacrifice on behalf of the cause and so on, in real life, in material and so on, um, they would not be Arab subjects anymore. They would be universal subjects. They would be emancipated. Sartre's signatures turns the clock on that and brings them back to this zone of non-being. Um, the sense of emptiness in Arab text after this betrayal, and it's being seen as an iconic betrayal in that sense, colossal betrayal, I call it you know, a colossal no exit to take on Sartre. It's really a position of no exit. Is devastating for a whole generation. There are others who were not influenced by this. Islamic thinkers didn't care much about that. Uh, and now they, have, they start their own project. But for uh, uh, the generation of Lutfi al Sahel, and dozens of others that I traced their lives, this is a devastating blow. There is a postscript of a very powerful exchange between Jean Paul Sartre and, um, and Lutfi al uh, after the war. Uh, in which Lutfi al a trial lawyer by training, basically goes after Sartre and try to to ask him, okay, let's go now, uh, uh, let's go now section by section, race, neocolonialism, otherness, um, and Sartre tells him what he thinks, and he tells him, don't you see that in Zionism it's the same? Don't you see what's happening in Israel? And in the end, Sartre sort of admits, but the script stayed in Arabic. Sartre refused to say anything about it in French. No one ever heard about it. The book, um, currently working to translate and publish this record, so there would be a record of actually what Sartre said, because in the end he did speak. It just stayed in Arabic and is never part of Sartre's biography. Um, just to conclude, um, the project of existentialism understood widely here as Arab existentialism as you can see, had various applications. It has application from theater to literature to, to hardcore politics, to state politics. It was really constitutive of a whole, of a whole generational project. Not a, not a project of all the people who live in the Middle East, but a, of a specific generation that was hegemonic, that, that, that managed to achieve hegemony, hegemony in the 50s and 60s. Um, the collapse of this project is being seen still today, and you can see traces of it, for example, in Edward Said and in the, in the famous piece he left in the London Review of Books in 2002, of, a, of an iconic betrayal not only of, of Sartre, but of the Sartre's legacy, which is a betrayal of the, of, of the French left and of critical theory as, as such, with the exception of Deleuze, everybody else, from Foucault, to uh, uh, Derrida and Etienne Balibar and others all continue to continue the same line of thought in which the Zionist uh, um, Jew is first of all a European, a, a victim of Europe and someone that have a higher status, unelaborated philosophically over the Palestinian other. This is still the issue we're, of course, dealing with, except that after May 68, the ground ethically shifts significantly in, in ways in which it would not appear as a dilemma the way it appeared um, to Sartre and others uh, back then. Thank you. Thank you very much.